Hi, my name is Sai. Um, so this is going to be a somewhat uh, more uh, participatory talk than most. Um, we'll get to that in a second. So uh, if you have any questions, and they're short questions, just shout them out and I'll answer them immediately. If they're longer questions, wait until the end. I will leave time for questions, I promise. Um, and if you see something that I cover that you know about, please nod your head so I can just track approximately what the audience level is of uh, knowledge of the information. So what is cognitive science? Cognitive science is kind of this fusion of a bunch of different fields. Um, psychology, philosophy, linguistics, artificial intelligence, uh, anthropology, philosophy. Um, and they also kind of cross. The one specifically that uh, I'm going to be talking today about is the cross with uh, psychology and this sort of cognitive um, model um, of science. And you'll see what, what we mean by that in a second. So here's first a, a simple question. Are other people rational? Yes or no? Not really, right? Um, now here's a different question. How about you? You rational? And no. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, that's, that's the other thing. Uh, to, to me, you're all, you know, you're all human, unfortunately, and we all have these same biases. Um, so here we go. Uh, first question, please participate. Ready? Which is larger, number of words with the first letter R or the third letter R? Who thinks it's first letter R? Raise your hand. Who thinks it's third letter R? Raise your hand. Oh my. Ah. OK, good. So here's a little exposition on that, because I actually covered this on my YouTube channel. Uh, and it's faster to do it highly edited. Ack. Oh well. Which should we be more afraid of, sharks or horses? Before we answer that, let's consider two more questions. Which kills more people each year? Car accidents, homicide, and suicide combined, or cancer? And are there more English words that start with the letter R, or do they have R as a third letter? When answering questions like these offhand, we tend to think in terms of examples, and assume that the more examples we can remember, the more common a thing is. Unfortunately, we remember some things much more easily than others, so this availability heuristic can lead us to make really bad assessments of risk. Things that are more commonly and vividly shown in the media, like a violent murder, will be a lot easier to remember than things that are far more common in real life but aren't as dramatic, like a cancer patient dying peacefully at home. Likewise, thinking of things in familiar ways, like alphabetical order, is a lot easier than new ways, like third letter order. But if we actually count the words, this intuition turns out to be wrong. More than twice as many words have R as the third letter than first letter. We can see this same effect happening in public policy. Americans spend 25 times more money fighting terrorism than fighting cancer, even though cancer kills almost 2,000 times as many people. Both policymakers and the public who elect them remember dramatic episodes of terrorism much more readily than boring statistics about cancer and that's how priorities are set. The only way to avoid this availability bias is to decide based on statistics, not the news. We just can't trust our intuition to realistically calculate risks. So, which causes more deaths, Jaws or My Little Pony? Sorry sharks, horses are the real killers. If you so. Um, so one other thing I get to demonstrate by using a video like that is the halo effect. Um, so if you're associated with something that's awesome, you'll sound smarter and you'll sound more right. So jazz music in the background sounds kind of cool and groovy, right? So that means I must be smart, right? Um, and it, it is a useful editing trick. So it turns out the, the ratio is actually one to two, um, but you don't think about it because of what I discussed there. And Another thing that people often mistake if you ask them, for example, which is more common, homicide or suicide? 
right? Homicide is, gets way, way more press. But actually, suicide is almost twice as common. Um, and similarly, you know, you've got, you've got this thing. For, this is uh, stolen from SMBC. Thanks for the Zach. Um, you know, people have an, an interesting um, dynamic when it comes to ris risk assessment. And this is called the availability heuristic, which is uh, the more familiar something is, the more, the more uh, sort of salient it is to you, the more common you will think it is, because it's easier for you to think about it. That doesn't mean it's actually more out there in the world. And a nice side effect of this is it increases your pareidolia. So what happens if you, say, are really, really religious and you see this? Or you see this. <laughs> um, you can see patterns in a lot of things. And what this ha makes happen is, you know, ads do work. Uh, and the, the funny thing about ads is the people who say that ads don't work on them are more susceptible to ads. Um, and if something feels scary, like, oh no, uh, ad, then you, know, you might want to sort of back off of just the raw reaction to that, because that raw reaction is fucking up your cognition. Um, it's better to think in terms of uh, actually thinking it through, rather than just basing it on some examples that come to mind. Um, this might come into play if you ever go to management school. Um, if you're asked to think of, you know, what is more common, and you, it's not something that you have indexed in your head, don't just go with a gut answer because you're wrong. <laughs> um, one benefit to this, though, is that the more familiar you are, um, the, less, uh, the, the less bad you'll feel about it. So uh, one interesting example from US politics is the more somebody knows a gay person, the more likely they are to support gay rights. Um, and yes, this is a causal effect. Um, so. Here's, here's another example. Uh, for this, I need to divide you into two groups. Uh, so you guys are the right group, and you guys are the left group, OK? Um, so I'm going to show you uh, uh, first some common information. Then I'm going to show you a slide that has like a check mark and an X. Uh, when you see the check mark on your side, close your eyes. Um, or rather, no. When you, when you see the X, sorry. When you see the X, close your eyes. When you see the check mark, keep your eyes open, uh, and just the next side will be for you. When you're finished reading it, nod your head so I know you're done. Don't say anything. Don't respond to it. Just nod your head uh, and you know, respond on your hand or something. Um, and commit to the answer just in your head. OK? So here we go. You're taking a trip to R Iraq. How much would you pay for the following? Close your eyes. Close your eyes. Nod your head when you're ready. OK? Now, switch. Open your eyes. Uh, right side. How much would you pay for the following? Nod your head when you're done. OK? OK, everyone open your eyes. How much would you pay? Now, raise your hand uh, if you would pay $5. $7? $8? $10? $11, $13, OK. So th there's this interesting thing. So what did I show you differently? Here we go. So the first group, you get this really specific cue, right? It's kind of evocatory. Um, it's something that you can easily visualize. Second group, you got this more broad sort of generic clue, right? But the thing is, of course, this generic cue covers more, right? If there's, you know, from any reason versus just from terrorism outside of the green zone, right? So obviously, the second one is worth more. But because the first one is more specific, you will think about it as more valuable. It'll come to mind easier. You'll, you'll think of situations more likely that fall within that. And so you'll be willing to actually pay more for that than you would if you, um, if you had it all aggregated. Here's another example. So suppose you have a six-sided die and you roll it 20 times. Four of the sides are green and two of the sides are blue. Which one of these, roll, which one of these successions would you bet on occurring 
within the 20, within the 20 roll sequence. So who would bet on A? Who would bet on B? Who would bet on C? Okay, so most people go for B, right? Now, you people are making a classic mistake. B is A plus another thing that has to happen, right? But it looks better because it has, you know, four to two, right? It looks closer representative uh, of what you're trying, uh, of what you think the, the odds are. But of course, that's not, you know, it's, it's obviously logically wrong because uh, if, you, if you go for B, you also have to get that green roll first, which reduces your odds. Now, this is called the representative heuristic. Um, it comes up a lot in different scenarios. So politics, for example, like I showed, uh, risks, pricing. So if you, uh, if you do the, the pricing thing where you just chop stuff up into not like a generic package, but you say, you know, how would you pay for insurance for this? How about for this? How about for this? How about for this? And you might see this in like rental car companies um, where you go to U-Haul and they say, well, how, would you, how much would you pay for this extra rider on your insurance and this extra rider? And it turns out you pay more overall. Um, the only way to avoid this is to actually calculate. Don't rely on estimation. So here's another kind of thing. Suppose you're in the US Air Force, and here's the data that you have on pilot training, right? So you get one pilot, they perform really well, and you praise them for it, and the next day, they perform worse. You have this other person, they perform pretty badly. You reprimand them, and the next day, they perform better. What's your conclusion for this on the effectiveness of praise versus criticism, right? So you might think, well, praise actually makes people worse and criticism makes people better, so I better just be a hard ass all the time, right? Now, of course, the problem is, is something sort of subtle there. So here's another example. Um, suppose you're testing the IQ of a bunch of kids. The first one's IQ is 150, genius, right? So what do you expect the average to be for all 50 kids? Who thinks it's 99? Who thinks it's 100? Who thinks it's 101? OK, so those of you who answered 100, uh, you're wrong. And I'll give you an example of why. Now, suppose you were testing, same exact thing, you're testing two kids. Uh, the average IQ in the general population is 100, right? So the first one is 150. What is the IQ of the second kid? If you believe that the average IQ for both kids is going to be 100, that means you think that the, the next kid is going to be an idiot. And there's no reason to believe that, right? The two are independent. Um, but, you know, it feels more similar. Here's another example. And this one is actually kind of serious. Cystic fibrosis is this disease where your lungs fill up with fluid. They get infected. Uh, you basically drown. Um, it can be corrected to a certain extent. Uh, it's a genetic disorder, so you know you can kind of maintain people on meds to make this better. But it's pretty serious. If you get a complication, you go in the hospital, you might die. Um, now, suppose you have this new pill that will raise your daily risk of getting a complication from 0.5% to 0.05%. And suppose you're already paying like 50 bucks for your pills. How much would you pay for the new pills? Any guesses? 10 bucks? 20 bucks, 30 bucks, 40, 100 bucks. So this is, this is sort of the magic of compound interest applied to disease, which is if something happens every single day, there's, a, there's you know, an accumulation of interest or there's an accumulated chance that you'll get in the hospital that day, it actually adds up really quick. So on the old pills, you actually had an 83% chance a year of landing in the hospital, whereas the new one's 16% which means you should be paying another 40 bucks a day or so, um, if not more, because you know, your, your actual value doesn't just scale linearly with your costs. So the, the, sort of the lesson from this is if something seems rare, but you're doing it all the time, it's going to happen, right? Like somebody wins the lottery. This is not surprising. It's surprising that any given person wins the lottery, but not that somebody wins the lottery. Uh, and you get this sort of, this movement, which is, um, you know, you might think, well, this looks like somebody is performing really well, like in the stock market, right? You've got these traders who perform really well for the last five years, 
Uh, and they say, well, you should pay me a bunch of money because I'm so awesome at picking stocks. But then you have to think, well, out of how many people are we selecting this one guy? And what's the chance that some of them just lucked out and happened to pick the, the right stocks for the last five years? It's actually pretty high. Uh, and if you run the numbers, it turns out, well, you know, it, it's not actually that much better to go with, go with uh, uh, a, a fund that's managed and you pay a lot of fees uh, compared to just, you know, an index. Um, now, here's a, a different kind of thing. Now, suppose you're in a jury uh, and you're at a trial where a city is getting sued by a private company uh, for failing to reinforce a bridge. Uh, they did an assessment and they, uh, you know, it's a pretty reliable assessment. They figured that the maximum damage it could do was a million bucks uh, and it would cost a hundred grand a year to fix. So they decided not to do it. Okay. Now, here's another bit of information. But first, Close your eyes, half the room. Okay, ready? Nod your head when you have read that. Yep, okay. Close your eyes, open your eyes. Nod your head when you read it. Yeah, okay. Everyone open their eyes. Was the city language in? Who thinks yes? Raise your hand. Who thinks no? Okay, so the difference between you two is this. First group, I just showed that. The second group, I also said last year it flooded. Now, the thing is, once you know that thing, it infects your brain. You cannot suppress this. Uh, it's called hindsight bias. Um, and this is why, for example, uh, in you know, jury trials, we have rules about, of evidence to suppress things from being known by the jury. Because, for instance, if you know that in this case it actually did happen, then you're more likely to think that they should have known at the time that it was going to happen. Even if you're explicitly told, ignore that, you can't. Um, so here's another kind of cute example. So what is this? I think it's a zombie. And now you do too. Um, you, cannot, you cannot unthink that. Here's another example. Do you see anything in the picture? Okay, so some of you found the dog. Now everybody's gonna find the dog, right? And now when you look at this, you will find the dog immediately. But someone who hasn't thought of the dog first, it takes a while to notice. Here's another example. FedEx logo, right? Did you notice that? A little arrow there? <laughs> Another example. Uh, have some fun at Cisco's expense. <laughs> Enjoy your next Cisco meeting. So yeah, there, there's some things as we all know, we've been on the internet, right? You can't really unsee. So it, it's not just for Goatsy. Um, it does work in, in real life. Um, here's, here's another kind of famous example. So uh, I want you to all say the color of the words that are on the next slide from top to bottom. There's going to be colored words. Just say the color of the word as fast as you can, OK? Ignore the text. Go. Okay. Yeah, that's what I was now let's try again. Ex again, color of the words only. Ignore the text. Go. <laughs> that fucks you up, doesn't it? Now the funny thing about this, which is called the Stroop effect, is. It cannot be suppressed. In fact, it's so good that you can use it as a test of whether someone knows the language or not. If it's actually nonsense to you, if, it, if that were in Greek, for instance, and you don't know Greek, I'm assuming, uh, then it wouldn't have any effect on you. You'd read it just as fast as for random other words. But since you know English, you, you can't. Uh, there is actually one fix for this, which is hypnosis. Uh, so if I were to hypnotize you first, 
and uh, get, give you a suggestion that uh, the words that you're about to see are nonsense, you don't know the language, they don't mean anything, then you actually start performing almost as good as you would otherwise. Um, and this is, this, and it's an interesting sort of bit of research. And what causes this? Well, the cause is that sort of at one level, you're trying to process the, the, the color of the words and acts as the language that goes with, you know, those color terms. At another level, uh, you're reading the words. Even though I tell you not to, you can't help it. It's a, re it's a reflex. It's an automatic kind of sort of lower level level of, um, of processing uh, in your linguistic system. Um, this also works for a couple other things. So there's an interesting study where um, if you uh, distract people uh, when they're going from one task to another, so you tell them, you know, count from backwards from 100 to zero as you go down this hall um, and, you know, go to the other experiment. Um, and then someone just happens to offer you in the middle of the hall, you know, totally unrelated to the study, um, they offer you, like, uh, some fruit or a candy bar, right? Um, now, if you were asked to think about something, to occupy your head, like to memorize something, to count, whatever, you will be more likely to go for the candy bar than the fruit. Whereas if you're just walking down the horn normally, your brain is free, you're going to be able to more use your higher level thought and say, well, no, the candy bar is worse for me, I'll, I'll pick the healthier fruit, right? Um, and of course, this comes up in shopping experiences, they're not unaware of this. Um, there's, there's an amusing other thing called the paradox of choice, which is actually the more choices you have, the less likely you are to buy because you get sort of brain locked on, you know, which one should I use? This is actually a problem for Linux distributions compared to OS X. Um, you might notice this effect. Um, there's also an amusing thing called Spock syndrome, which is um, like, shall we say, a lot of neurological disorders are like this, where they're really hilarious if you don't have them because um, they, they fuck you up pretty badly. So Spock syndrome is this uh, disorder where people, uh, their uh, medial frontal uh, lobe um, gets um, damaged. And basically they can't feel emotions, right? So you'd think, you know, oh, this person's super logical Spock, you know, they must maybe be awesome at making decisions. Turns out, no, they're absolute shit. Uh, and the reason is, Okay, they can tell you, you know, if you offer them a pen versus a pencil, they can tell you all the advantages of picking a pen and all the advantages of picking a pencil. And they can't fake, make up their fucking minds because they can't make a sort of a value decision because that part actually comes for your emotional processing. So, go figure. Anyway, next thing. Close your eyes, open your eyes. Close, close. <laughs> okay, ready? Go. Just answer to this yourself, nod your head or shake your head. Okay. Okay, close your eyes, open your eyes. Again, nod your head or shake your head. Just respond to the question. Got it? Okay, everyone open your eyes. Now, um, how many African countries are there in the, in the UN? Uh, and I'm going to just go by tens, okay? How many people think it's 10, uh, you know, plus or minus 5? 10? 20? 30? 40? 50? 60? 70? 80? Okay, so what was the difference between the two groups? Uh, the answer happens to be 53. Um, and the, the difference between the two groups is, first one, I ask you to compare first to 10. Now 10 is, of course, a total under, uh, undercut, right? The, uh, the second group, I ask to compare to 100. 100 is also obviously way off. But the thing is, this works even if you use an absurd anchor, right? Uh, you can ask people this question about, when did Albert Einstein arrive in the US? For one anchoring choice, you give them like 1753. Right? For the other anchoring choice, you give them 2004. Right? These are ob both obviously absurd. The funny thing is, it works just as well as if you pick a non-absurd anchor, and the people who uh, have the 2004 one will answer a higher number than the people who answer uh, the 1773 one. Um, and the thing is, once you're exposed to this, you cannot suppress it. Even if you try to suppress it, you cannot. Um, 
And of course, again, this comes up in shopping. So limit 12 per customer. They don't care if you buy more. They just want you to buy more. Um, now, here's another uh, sort of interesting test. Um, this is uh, a, de a task that's normally done on a computer, right? So on one side, you hit you know A. On the other hit side, you hit the semicolon. So instead of A and semicolon, use your hands. Um, so if it's on that side of the if if the thing in the middle, so I'm going to show you either text or a photo. If the thing in the middle matches a black face or a bad word, raise your left hand. If it's a white face or a good word, raise your right hand. Okay? Ready? And do it as fast as you can. Go. Ready? Next. Go. Ready? Next. Go. Ready? Next. Go. Okay. Now here's the second set. All I've done is switched the bottom two categories. Okay? Same exact task, except now if you see it on the left hand, left side, it's a black face or a good word, raise your left hand. If it's on the right side, uh, white face or bad word, raise your right hand. Okay, ready? And go. Ready? Go. Ready? Go. Ready? Go. Ready? Go. <laughs> fine, fine. Okay, maybe that one wasn't as, uh, I didn't think of that part. You got me. Okay. So this is called the implicit association test. And so you remember how before we were talking about you have these kind of conflicts in your head um, about if you're, you're primed to think a certain way and then that conflicts with uh, some other thing that you're trying to do, like the Stroop effect, for instance, um, it actually causes you a delay, right? You, you're, it takes more time to process this and more time where you're like, I'm not quite entirely sure. It reduces your certainty. Uh, so the thing is, if you, if you ask people if they're racist, generally speaking, even people who are racist are going to deny it because it's not acceptable in our culture, right? So if you ask people like, uh, are you more uncomfortable around black people than white people? Um, if you ask people, should black people have fewer rights than white people? Should black and white people not be allowed to marry? These are, you know, standard questions on a racism attitude scale. Most people will say, no, I'm not racist, and they'll, they'll vote in, in accordance with that. But the thing is, if you give them this test, um, and they respond quicker when, a, when they have to respond the same way to a good thing in a white face than to a bad thing in a black face, um, so that pairing, versus if they're different, so you have a bad, bad thing and a black face, or a bad thing in a white face, or a good thing in a black face, right? So in one case, it's consonant uh, with racism. In the other case, it's uh, dissonant with racism, right? If they perform worse in the dissonant case, then that means that it's harder for them to sort of implicitly think of a black person and a good thing together. Now, it leads to another interesting test that came up in the news lately. What do you think this one's used for? So uh, it's, it measures sort of implicit orientation, right? Uh, so you see either gay things or straight things, and then uh, you also see either things associated with yourself uh, or things associated with other people. Um, now you might ask, okay, well, is it real, right? Like, are they really gay? Uh, are they really racist? Because it only comes up in this sort of implicit thing. Well, you know, it's actually not entirely clear. It's kind of a question of how do you choose to, to view this thing? Um, now, overtly, they're not racist. Overtly, uh, these people are not gay. They don't have sex with guys. They are generally homophobic, right? But the thing is, if the, the, those two things are different, it turns out that 
uh, it correlates really well with certain things. Namely, they're more homophobic, uh, and they grew up with more controlling and homophobic parents. Now, is that real or not? Well, you know, uh, in science we tend to believe in uh, effects, right? Does it, does it correlate to something that is uh, observable as a difference? And in this case, it does. Uh, in racism examples, likewise, it does. Um, so for example, uh, a, a different kind of test that you can do for racism is you mail out a bunch of resumes to people. Uh, and the only thing that's different about the two sets of resumes you send is one set has uh, white names on it, and the other set has black names on it. Guess who gets more callbacks? But then you call them and you say, well, you know, you called for this one and not this one, why? Um, or you call them and say, you know, do you, do you have a preference for white people? And they'll say no, of course. But their responses kind of betray otherwise. Um, I'm going to try to leave a lot of time for, for questions, because uh, you know, I'm sure I've brought up a bunch of things. But one closing thing, which is, I think, uh, amusing. So again, participation. So you guys, get up. Um, and you're just going to run in place, OK? Hold on a second. And you guys, I want you to do a brief meditation exercise which is close your eyes and just concentrate on your breathing. Breathe in, breathe out, nice and, nice and quietly. Try to relax and ignore the thundering that's about to happen, OK? Uh, I'll time it, 30 seconds, ready, go. Try to get your heart rates up. Fifteen seconds. Five, four, <laughs> three, two, one. Okay. Sit down. Open your eyes. Now, I'm not going to assume your orientation, so pick whichever you prefer. Um, and think, how attractive are they on a scale of one to ten? Okay, so who thinks one, two, three, four, five? Uh, pick one or pick both if you're bi. <laughs> Whichever you prefer. Uh, and ten, of course, is most attractive. So again, uh, four, five, six. Seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, so th th there's this interesting effect, which is um, uh, I'm blanking on the on the actual term of it, um, which is um, you attribute your emotions to your bodily sensations. So when you're highly sexually aroused your heart starts beating more, you sweat a little bit, you, um, so your eyes sort of dilate, um, right? You, you have these, all these physiological reactions. Uh, and similarly, when you're not attracted to someone, you feel a little colder, you feel a little more removed. Um, and the thing is, how you interpret your physical sensations sort of bubbles up into your emotions. And if you're more sort of recently exercised, um, you're more likely to find someone attractive. This also happens if you, you, know, you just went through some harrowing experience. So one, one way that this was tested is uh, they get a grad student, who's the same grad student in both cases, um, who's fairly pretty, um, and she meets people who have just crossed either a fairly safe bridge or like this really narrow, kind of um, not entirely trustworthy bridge that swings and everything, and it kind of raises your adrenaline, right? And then they go to the end, and she asks him a few questions, and she says, you know, how attractive do you think I am? Uh, the ones who go through the narrow bridge, much more likely to rate her at attractive, much more likely to try to get her number. Um, and this also happens for another, another interesting case, was um, you give people caffeine, but you don't tell them you're giving them caffeine. Um, and in one case, you say, you know, we gave you caffeine. In the other case, you say, we gave you a placebo. Uh, and you show them like a scary stimulus or something. 
Uh, the ones where you gave them caffeine, but they don't know to attribute it to the caffeine, they think they're a lot more scared because caffeine maps very closely to the symptoms of being scared. So anyway, so overall, I would say, you know, here are lots of flaws, right? Um, and the important thing is, okay, some of them you can't really stop. Once you're infected by a piece of information, you pretty much can't ignore it. But what you can try to do is you can try to ignore it or suppress it in those kinds of situations where you can. You can try to realize, oh, you know, this reaction that I'm having, I don't feel quite as sure about, right? Like I, I feel some like slight niggle of doubt uh, and act on that. So uh, another, another interesting example, I, I have, uh, uh, an interview with a guy who did this research on my YouTube channel, if you want to read it, um, which is, um, so there's these standard questions um, where you oppose a logical mode of thinking with a more heuristic mode of thinking. So yesterday, for example, someone brought up base rate fallacy, base rate neglect, right? Which is, um, so if you ask people, okay, I interviewed like a thousand engineers, and uh, 10 construction workers. And um, I have this profile of someone. Which do you think it is, a construction worker or an engineer? The profile is as follows. Uh, this is someone who likes drinking beer. Uh, they like working out. They like to watch sports. Um, which one do you think it is, an engineer or a construction worker? Now, the heuristic answer, of course, is it's a construction worker. But that ignores the fact there's a hundred more engineers in the sample, right? That massively overwhelms. Now, people universally pretty much suck at this. However, there's an interesting effect, which is um, people, even though they suck, will express more doubt in this kind of case than if it's, if, than if it's the logical thing. So they have this sort of underlying level of logic that's processing it. And it just doesn't quite rise the level of awareness. It rises enough to instill some sort of doubt, but you're not really aware of why you have the doubt. You don't attribute it to that at all. You're just like, well, it doesn't quite fit or something. Um, but what you can do, and, and it's interesting that this is sort of the, the, the thing that makes the difference between the group that answers sort of really logically, like logicians, uh, professional logicians, if you do that, they'll, they'll catch that. Um, and the, the group that answers really badly is you can tell by their brain reactions, by their skin conductance, they have this effect and they just don't notice it. They just don't act on it, right? But if you think about it and you notice, okay, I'm feeling this bias, I'm feeling this you know, thing that's pushing me off of being logical, Notice it, act on it, and fall back to something that is logical processing. Because you, you, you're aware that your sort of heuristic compromising is, uh, your hist heuristic processing is compromised. Um, a few other suggestions. Uh, Tversky and Kahneman wrote an excellent article, later made it into a full book, called Judgment Under Uncertainty. All of the stuff you can find there, it's a little bit old, but they won the Nobel Prize for it. Uh, well, one of them died, unfortunately, before he could get the Nobel Prize, but effectively he did. Uh, it's really awesome. Uh, there's also this uh, work online you can find called Harry Potter and the Methods of Rationality. I hate Harry Potter. I love this work. Uh, you should read it. I promise you'll laugh. Um, there's this game called Zendo, which is an induction game. Uh, it's normally played with uh, these pieces called an ice house set, which is a bunch of pyramids, but you can really play it with anything, literally. Playing cards, stuff outside, words. Uh, words are a little complicated, but um, look it up online, you'll see. And of course, my YouTube channel. Hmm. Um, thank you for everyone who helped me out getting here. Thank you, Hikari. Um, and yeah, any questions? Yo. You know, in this contentious political um, time, you know, that's when I think a lot of this stuff comes up for me. You know, um, like I look at Mitt Romney, and you know, I have a hard time not receiving him very negatively in a lot of different ways. And it's clear the other side also is having this kind of, you know, experience where they're sure he's Obama's horrible. And to me, he looks to be about equivalent to Bush. Um, you know, uh, and so what I wonder is why we don't try to teach, like in schools, 
these principles so people can learn to question their... Well, um, you're preaching to the choir on that one. <laughs> what I think it is is because this is probably what we interpret as moral relativism of some sort, or something like that by well, people that are caught in... Right. So... I don't think it's really moral relativism. Uh, I do think it should be taught as part of critical thinking. Um, but he, so you raise sort of this political context of you know one side, uh, the, the sides often talk past each other, right? This is called framing. Uh, if you want to know more on that, uh, look up George Lakoff. Uh, he has several books specifically on this. He also has a really great book called Metaphors We Live By. Um, I had a couple of classes with him. Um, so. There, there's this thing of framing where, for example, in the abortion debate, right? So I'm not going to take sides, but um, one one side of the debate um, frames it as pro-life, which is basically uh, murder is bad uh, and killing a fetus is murder, right? So you're bad if you do that. The other side frames it as pro-choice, right? Control of your body is good. People should be able to control their body. Therefore, they should be able to have abortions. Now, if you notice, they're, they're completely talking past each other, right? They're not actually addressing each other's arguments at all. Both of them agree murder is bad. Both of them agree choice is good. It's just sort of how you frame the issue. Um, now, there, there's this interesting study about uh, the, how convincing something is politically, um, which is if you show something that's a relatively extreme position, um, relatively dissimilar from your own, you are actually more likely to go even further in your own direction. Why? Because you can see all the reasons that this is obviously flawed thinking, obviously flawed ideology, right? They haven't considered this. This is easy to rebut, right? And so you go even further in the direction of your own pre-existing belief. Whereas if you see a really moderate decision that's not too far away from you, it disagrees with you, but it's relatively close, you're actually likely to shift closer to it and become more moderate yourself. Now, you might notice this is not necessarily what's happening predominantly in the media. Um, and if you wanted to change a political environment, that might be something to change. Um, that's, you know, makeyourlaws.org, that's something I'm working on, but yeah. Um, yo. Yeah, lesswrong.com is uh, Eliezer's primary blogging site, and he has a, a whole bunch of other blogs, uh, bloggers that go there. It's awesome. biases is something that uh, you can do by reading. It's also something you can do by playing games. I haven't tried Zendo yet, but uh, for people who enjoy board games, um, there's a little less wrong uh, meetup thing in Portland that we do, and uh, we've come up with, uh, you could do this with any activity, but you can get books and lists of cognitive biases, come up with some way of like randomly selecting one, and play a cooperative activity like the game Pandemic or something with people where everybody has a cognitive bias that is affecting their play in the game negatively and they have to act in the game with that bias to the detriment of the other players until that bias is identified by the other players. And it's this, they dramatically overact. That like, sounds really I'm super interesting. overconfident or I have like this position of like authority where the last person was, who was like did something right it must be right this time or like these really obvious guys. <laughs> But it's a lot of fun, and it, it makes you just kind of like like try and like pick apart the actions of others and yourself and whatnot and try to figure out these things. It's, it's been a helpful exercise, so I recommend it. Yeah, uh, uh, just for the camera, since you're not mic'd. Um, the idea is go to a list of biases. By the way, there's a really good one uh, on Wikipedia, a list of cognitive biases. It's a page. They have lists for everything. Um, and it's actually a really good one. A uh, list of, um, of uh, fallacies is also a really good one. Um, so play a game, and every player takes on one of those biases um, and, uh, until it's identified by the other players. That's, I like that. That's clever. Anyway, uh, next. Yep. Uh, just saying, I have a Zendo set, so uh, I can set it up like, just right outside over there after this talk. Awesome. Let's play Zendo. Yeah. <laughs> Z-E-N-D-O. Uh, the, I'll, I'll give you a short synopsis of the game, which is, um, so Zendo is a, a, a dojo where you practice Zen. Um, and um, a, a Zendo game is a game of induction. The uh, one player is the master and the, all the others are um, students. The master uh, decides on a pattern. Uh, it's based on some uh, 
absolute rule that's objectively determinable whether some koan, which is what a, a, a sort of a group of pieces is called, meets the rule or doesn't meet the rule. If it meets the rule, it has the Buddha nature. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Um, and the rest of the students try to guess what is the rule um, based on um, uh, you know, presenting koans and asking the master, does this fit or not, and so forth. So it's, an it's a very interesting game where you, uh, one thing that people who are new to it often do is they only try to confirm the rule that they're thinking of, confirmation bias, right? One of the things I didn't mention. Um, and it's a nice test for that, because to, to really understand the rule, you need to actually try to disconfirm what you're thinking the rule is. Otherwise, you'll just perseverate, and maybe it just has coincidentally works with your rule. But anyway, uh, anyone else? Some wind on happiness. What? Uh, stumbling, stumbling on happiness. On happiness. I, I haven't heard of it. Any other questions, comments? Yeah, I think, like, therapists, at least the way I understand it, they have a supervising therapist, because basically you can never be sure that you're not, you know, off in some way. And, uh, you know, I, I sort of wonder how we can, you know, do that for each other, uh, or whether you even think that makes sense, or whether you really can apply rules and be pretty sure that you're getting the right, you know, you're getting a clear perspective, or whether we need a power process to help us. Right, so um, how can you have like a check on your own biases? Uh, so you, you mentioned therapists actually. In my experience, therapists are especially bad at this. Um, you know, if, if they think you, know, you have this syndrome, they can find ways to make you match that syndrome. Um, there's, there's actually this, this interesting flaw I, I think I, I should probably warn you about, which is it's called the sophistication effect. So confirmation bias in general means that you interpret new evidence to confirm your existing theory of the world, right? Like, if you think someone's an asshole already, and they, you know, do something that's a bit ambiguous, you're going to interpret it as if they're an asshole, as, if, as opposed to as if, you know, they just, you know, messed up or they forgot something or whatever. They're, you're going to interpret it as if they're intentionally doing, to, doing it to piss you off. Um, now, the sophistication effect is this ironic thing, which is the one exception to <laughs> the previous rule, uh, which is the more you know about cognitive biases, the worse you are at the, at the confirmation bias because the better you are at identifying other people's flaws in ambiguous situations. So if someone gives a message, uh, you know, you see a study, you see a report, uh, someone argues for a certain position, and you're really good at spying, spotting all these biases, you'll say, oh, you know, they're just making this bias. They're, they just have this, this cognitive flaw. Uh, and you'll, the thing is, though, you'll do that selectively, you're more likely to do that when it's somebody who disagrees with you than when it's somebody who agrees with you. And so you're actually more vulnerable to the confirmation bias. Um, the only way to fix this um, is to be sort of extra harsh uh, to things that agree with you, um, because otherwise you, you wouldn't think to do so. So to, to more directly answer your point, um, so how can we have checks on ourselves? Um, now. If you remember the, the example I gave of the court case, right, uh, where you, you have this effect of, uh, of hindsight bias, this is the reason that you have like firewalls within organizations. This is why you have reserve juries. This is why you, don't, you make sure not to tell people. This is why if you're building software where there's some sort of uh, disclosure issue or if there's a security issue, ideally and often, oftentimes, you want the penetration testing team to not know what the source code is, to not know how it was developed, because if you know it, you, it sort of filters your perception of it. Um, and it filters, you know, oh, you know, this is probably the vulnerability, this is probably the vulnerability. And sure, there's a lot you can do from knowing it and knowing how it's structured, but it also limits and filters your perception in, in kind of hard to avoid ways. Um, Similarly, uh, you mentioned you know therapists. Um, you can have ombudsmen's uh, offices where they're not associated with the rest of the university uh, in the hierarchy. They have their own separate thing. They can they can act as sort of an ethical check from the outside. 
Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the Stanford prison experiment. Um, that was stopped by Zimbardo's wife. Because Zimbardo's like, you know, look at this awesome experiment. I'm getting all these great results. These kids are breaking down left and right. And the wife is like, what the fuck, dude? Uh, and it's only after that that he realized, you know, maybe this isn't quite ethical. Uh, and he stopped the experiment. Uh, so yeah, outside people are awesome. Go. I actually found when I first started doing information security work, I did something I had to pen test that I knew basically the flaws were. And I would miss the others. Yeah, I spoke to someone I knew would be there, so I wasn't. And, and it's also easier to, that. you know, easier to break the shit that you know how to break, right? As opposed to doing all the work to find some random other bug that you don't even know is there yet. Yeah. Um, Isn't someone who is highly skilled in cognitive bias uh, does it make it easier to just make decisions like how to vote, or does it make it harder, or is it harder for you? Right. So there's this issue of you know if you're more sophisticated about these, does it cause cause you to sort of paralyze because you need to get all the information and process it and, and analyze it? Um. You know, that's actually kind of a, a difficult thing. Um, and yes, you're right, uh, in large part, that does happen. Um, there is a time at which you have to say, well, you know, I have enough confidence given the information I have to make a decision. Um, and you try to approach it first of saying, you know, were my sources diverse enough? Uh, were, were my sources, you know, was I making decision based on generalized enough information that I'm not just, you know, getting, getting one perspective on this? Um, so yeah, you, you, you do need to sort of act as a check on yourself for that, um, but it's subtle. Um, and this is, uh, I don't know if you, you saw my talk yesterday, I'm working on this project called MakeYourLaws.org, uh, which is a practical liquid democracy project. Um, and one of the issues that we're, we have to deal with is getting people to author legislation collectively, right? And obviously most people are very uninformed uh, about a lot of things. Um, and to some extent, we can say this with delegation to, to experts. Um, but to some extent, we, we face this fundamental problem of voter education, of educating you as to you know, what is the background on, on this issue before you decide how to legislate it. Um, so one example, for example, that comes up uh, in the real world is people uh, in real world legislators, later legislatures, um, will often pass laws, for instance, to make it illegal for a convicted sex offender uh, to live within X miles of a school or a playground or this other thing. Um, and what turns out to happen in some cases is basically they've parceled out the entire city where the only place they're allowed to live and they're required to live in the city, um, otherwise they violate their probation, is under a bridge somewhere. Right? Literally, that's the only place they're legally allowed to live. Um, and obviously, this means you know, they have a harder time to f holding a job, they're more stressed, they're more likely to reoffend. Whereas, um, you know, how far they are from a school doesn't actually affect their, their chance of reoffending that much. Um, but people make these decisions based on this sort of intuitive feel of how the, the rule might play out, and they fail to check has someone done this before? <laughs> what were the results? How are we different from those other situations such that we would expect a different result? Because if you don't expect a different result, if you're the same kind of thing and you're expecting something else to happen, you're pretty stupid. <laughs> um, so it's this complicated problem of education, delegating to experts, um, and then, you know, let alone if you try doing fact checking, which we have a commitment to do in some respects, and you know, people are voting on policies regarding climate change, policies regarding uh, the efficacy of the death penalty, um, policies regarding you know all sorts of things where there's there's data available, um, but they have these strong intuitive beliefs. They often will just reject the data um, because they'll they'll think of some way that you know it might be flawed, some way it might be a conspiracy, some way to make it consistent with their beliefs. So it's a very hard problem. Unfortunately. Anyone else? 
Okay. Uh, if you have any further questions, uh, I'll be outside. Please come talk to me. Uh, and also, by the way, I am doing meditation workshops. So I, I have this all other side. Meditation workshops on the beach half an hour before sunset every day, which is 8 p.m. So the sunset is at 8.30. It's gorgeous. You should join me. It's a different technique every day. I promise I'll teach you something you don't know. Thank you very much.